All right. I want you to imagine for a moment what your life could be like if the people in it would only do what you ask them to do. I know. Totally amazing. There is a way of dramatically increasing the likelihood that people in your life will actually do what you ask them to do. The challenge is knowing the way. And I spent uh, five years as the producer of TEDx Stanley Park, one of the largest TEDx's in the world. And, the la and last year, I started my alternative to TEDx Stanley Park, which is called Get Inspired Talks. And the piece that was consistently missing was the, uh, the, uh, the ability to take an inspired audience, an audience that had great intentions to do this, this, and this, and they walk out the front doors, life happens. And life, happen, life happening derailed them from actually doing these noble things that they all had a good heart to do. So those good things didn't happen. And then I met this man. And this man showed me the missing link. You see, I believe there are four steps to actually causing an audience, which might be an audience of one, it might be an audience of 10,000, to take action. The first one is great information. The second one is a call to action that's clear. The third one is inspiration. And the fourth one was the missing one. And that was support to take the first step. Here to describe the behavioral science behind that thesis that the fourth step is the first taking support to take the first step, I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you to put your hands together and give Chris Taylor a very, very warm welcome. Seems like we're shaking hands. Nice. We are, indeed. <laughs> Hello. Thank you to the three of you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for being here. I, I had no idea this was the first time that it was a Monday, um, which is maybe why you get some new faces up. Hello, Dave. Is this your, is your first time here? W welcome. Have you had some Kool-Aid? No, I'm just, that's a terrible joke. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I could give you a little bit of context, backstory, so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I run a company called Actionable. I started it in 2008. Um, and way back then, the whole purpose of the business was to help myself uh, take ideas from popular business books and translate them into action. So I don't any readers, and by readers, I mean you've read a book since university. Perfect. <laughs> Honestly, it's like 30% like of the population or something scary. Um, you get these great ideas, you get this great inspiration, and then you read the next book. And so my objective back in 2008 was to uh, make actionable some of these ideas from business books. And so I started a blog, it turned into a thing. We built a community of people. If you're interested in business books, it's still alive, actionablebooks.com. It's all free, it's like 1200 actionable summaries on the website. Um, so I started that and it was uh, fun, but it was really more of a passion project. I was still working at the time. Uh, I quit my full-time job to work on Actionable full-time when uh, there was an opportunity identified to take some of those summaries and turn them into team-based conversations where intact, typically corporate teams, could actually unpack the idea from good to great or uh, pick another business book, Seven Habits, and uh, understand it in a way that they could take action on it in regards to their business. And I became very interested in, fascinated in, that transition point from, we just had a conversation, we were just inspired by the idea in this book, how do we now take action on it? And so I went deep into the behavior science around habit formation, around uh, sort of sticking with it, sustainment of learning concepts. Um, and since that time, fast forward, uh, we now work exclusively through and with consulting partners. So coaches, facilitators, consultants that have their own practice with their own clients, and they integrate actionable science and technology into their client operations. So about 140 consulting firms that we work with around the globe, about 40,000 people a year, that are shifting habits as a result of uh, the conversations that they're having with their teams. So that's a little bit of background and basis. Any questions on me, who I am? Anybody in the wrong room? 
Yes, Patty? What's your name? My name is Chris Taylor. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> so I'm hoping that there's three things that we can unpack today that will be relevant for you and your practice. So one is uh, getting clear on what clients really care about when they're hiring. Who, who here in the room would define themselves as a coach, a consultant, or a facilitator? And for the rest of you, why, why did you come? Just out of, <laughs> out of curiosity. Dawson, what was it that brought you here today? Okay, great. Anybody else who's not a consultant, coach, facilitator? I'm always curious. Okay. Leader, fine. That's it. Yeah, yes, we're in the, yes, it's fine. You're, you're welcome to stay. Um, <laughs> it was more, I'm just curious, right? When we talk about it being positioned for consultants, those that come that aren't, I'm always curious, but yes. <laughs> Perfect, good, yeah, I get that. That's why I'm here too. Um, so number one is, uh, getting clear on what your clients actually care about, what they're buying when they purchase from you. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time on that and what we've seen uh, through the consultants that we work with and as we, as there's sort of a recession looming, um, you know, one of the first budgets to get cut or reduced is the learning and development, the training space, right? As I'm sure many of you have experienced that sort of crunch. Um, so how you can sort of reposition that. Second is how to give it to them, the thing that they actually want. Uh, and then third is where to start. So giving you some practical takeaways on how you can bring uh, certain sciences to your proposals to increase close rates and uh, see client retention moving beyond. I spend almost every day working with uh, dozens of consultants on this exact stuff. So hopefully there's some stuff of value in here. I also wanna make this interactive. Uh, so we will have discussion and small group stuff as we go through it. Do you work at Google or are you just wearing the shirt? Wearing the shirt? Yeah. I guess I paid Google. <laughs> I should be like a NASCAR driver. I should have like Amazon here and Google here. And just, uh, I, I get it. Get paid for that. That's it. So, so here's the question that we're ultimately going to attempt to answer in our time together is how do you differentiate your service offerings in an increasingly crowded market? The International Coach Federation two weeks ago posted a, a stat that they are currently graduating a thousand coaches a week from their programs. Wow. If you're a coach, that, that should be mildly terrifying, right? The market's being saturated by barely educated people, right? And that's something as ICF, it's just these people literally just graduated, right, from their coaching, and, and it started to become an increasingly crowded market. If you are selling an intangible, selling your services, selling your training, selling your coaching, how do you differentiate yourself in that market? That's a real question, yeah. Video marketing. Can you elaborate on that, Eric? Um, story. Story is a great thing to differentiate your business from the other guys. There might be a thousand uh, coaches, but what makes you special as a person is being or as a business is that you can help someone with a specific problem. Perfect. So they, they want to coach. They see your personality shining through in your videos. I say, you're the coach that I want. Yeah. So the personality, the connection, the the credibility that comes with storytelling. Awesome. Yeah, Patty. You can say the results. Results? Results. As in past results? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Then you'll say, here's the, can you, particularly if we talk about something like coaching or training, how would you demonstrate <laughs> those results? So, for example, if I was teaching someone how to be a coach, I would say, like, this or less. Hypothetically. Um, yeah, hypothetically. Um, then the results that I've got from the testimony. Nice. So you're building some credibility, some trust through those historic examples. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's having a niche, whether it's like vertical or horizontal, like you're doing it for a specific industry, or yeah. you have a very defined service. So if you do need to YouTube marketing within that influencer video marketing. Right. So when people think YouTube marketing, they think Marlin, right? Yeah, and what's, that's what's your specialty. Exactly. Yeah. Leaning in. Nice. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, nice. So you get to know each other a little bit through the 30 minute. I'm going to, I'm going to offer all of you a 30 minute consultation at the end of today. So you've been warned. Um, also, you don't have a name tag. What's your name? Uh, yeah, my name is Alex. Hello, Alex. Welcome. Referral. Referral. Referral from a trusted mutual contact. Nice. Yep. Awesome. So you're getting that, again, that sort of embedded trust. Yes. Niche, but 
Nice. Yeah, so we've got, so niche can be either an, a body of expertise for whoever wants to tap into that, or it could be a specific group of people and potentially a broader uh, range of services for that specific group of people. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Right, your IP, your intellectual property, right? People saying that, I want that, I've heard about that, give me that, right? It's Patrick Lencioni, does anyone know Patrick Lencioni, the name? He's got the five dysfunctions of a team uh, model. People are like, I want the five dysfunctions thing, right? And so Pat continues to do well because of that, yeah. Cool, awesome. I love the interactivity, thank you guys. What I want to explore here is the clinically cold, ultimate decision maker or approver within a client organization. And what I mean by that is all of, most of the things that we described here with the exception of tangible hard results that I can say that, that's a result of this, our learning value proposition benefits, right? It's going to make me feel better, it's gonna make me grow, it's gonna develop the skill set. It's, so the, the, the industry of learning and development, right? By and large, by most clinical CFOs, some COOs, some CEOs, is an expense or an investment? What do you think? Expense, who says expense? Who says investment? Interesting. I know it's an investment. I believe in it being an investment. But do you think that the clinical CFO, what's the definition of an investment versus an expense? Say it again. Yeah, right, I put a dollar in, I get $2 out. And it's clear that this dollar in equaled that number of dollars out. If most CEOs, CFO, COOs saw learning and development as an investment, why would it be one of the first things on the chopping block when it comes to expense reduction? Yes? You're not measuring it properly. Sure. Right. We, so we're, we're in this room because we, we are in the space of learning and development. We know that it is an investment. Right? The people that we work with directly know that it is an investment. Right? They see the value, they're advocates for us. They end up with testimonials, we end up with referrals. And that's how the industry continues to sort of sustain itself. But when budgets contract, or when an internal client is trying to get approval for a bigger program than the budget was defined for, designed for, there is no additional budget. Right? Because in most cases, the sort of C-suite has identified it as an expense line, not as an investment. It's got a fixed amount of money to it. There is no more money for this. Okay. Alternatively, if you imagine a marketing spend where we said, hey, we just spent money on YouTube ads. Here's all the metrics that show that $1 in equals $4 out. Can we get some more money? Do you think they get more money? Absolutely. Of course they get more money, right? Because it's very clear that from a business growth standpoint, this is a good investment. Right, which is very different. So even though we know that learning and development is an investment, it's very difficult in many cases to actually showcase that. And in many cases, it's because we're actually measuring the wrong things or our client is internally. So hopefully you find this model helpful. Client perception, when they think about you as a vendor, they think about you on, on multiple axes, but the two that we focus on here today is quality of programming, right? Are you delivering bad programming do people not like your session or do they love your session when you're delivering that session right the other is around identified business impact so can we how strongly can we identify that spending money on this half day uh, emotional intelligence training is actually equaling a business outcome yeah. what's worth considering is that the person who's hiring you to do one of these roles may be down at the vendor procurement level Right? They've been tasked with finding someone to coach Steve in marketing or to run the sales training half day course. And they've been told you've got 10 grand and you need it to fit within this sort of 60 day time frame. go. They're down at the vendor procurement level. Their job is to find somebody that, that checks the boxes that have been defined for them in the first place. Is that fair? How are we doing by the way? Is this resonating? Are we, yeah. If, you're, if you need a nap, there's a spot here. Just <laughs> help yourself. So. Um, but if you go back up to the very top of the organization when the budget was being created in the first place, in my experience, there was a business decision made around why we need to spend money on sales training or on emotional intelligence or on diversity and inclusion or on coaching Steve, right? I don't know what's up with Steve today. Kevin's usually my fall guy, but it's Steve tonight. 
But there was a reason for that, right? There was a business outcome that was aspired to that determined, yeah, we need to put some money into that because if we can turn Steve around, it's going to lead to X dollars growth in the business right? at the budget creation level, ideally. But then it gets determined at the allocation level that in order to spend that 10 grand effectively, we're going to get Steve a coach. And then it goes down to procurement, find a coach for Steve. Yeah? What's interesting in here is that the different layers care about different quadrants within this box. Right? The vendor procurement person is largely focused on getting as high up the vertical axis as they possibly can. Give me someone good. Show me the testimonials. Show me the referrals. Show me the fact that, other, I, that my job's not in jeopardy when I hire this person and they're terrible. Right? I've got all these great sources saying this person's really good. They're enjoyable. You got a 97% enjoyment rate in the session, et cetera. So their focus is on achieving that top box about just focusing on quality of programming. Right? Everyone's trying to avoid the bad spend box. Right? That's not a good place to be. And I'd suggest, uh, well, I don't, I don't know you, but let's hope none of you are in that box. If you're delivering good stuff relative to the dollars you're charging, you're going to be up in the quality of programming side. What's interesting when you look at the right side of the, the pyramid, though, is the stuff that's bad spend, but high, high business impact, for example, compliance training. We absolutely positively have to have all of our people go through this safety training thing, right? And if we don't, we're gonna get shut down by the province. Okay? If you had to choose then between spending money on that thing, a terrible delivery of something that the business has to have versus exceptional delivery of something that we can't quite see the financial connection to, what are, what are the encounters gonna choose? They're gonna, they're gonna be down here. They're gonna go with this, is that fair? Does anyone violently disagree with that? Okay, thanks, good. They will, right? This stuff gets the money before that stuff gets the money because we need it to keep the wheels of the business rolling. The ideal place to be, of course, is in the top quadrant where you're delivering exceptional quality programming and you can show the business impact that your work is having. Because if you can show the business impact, maybe not compliance-based training, but maybe it's around being able to say, when you spend money on this, I can show you over time how that actually leads to one of three things, right? Revenue increase, cost decrease, or assets appreciating. That's, at the end of the day, that's what business is about, right? One of those three things. And I would suggest that if you're in nonprofit or if you're in government, you go, that doesn't really apply, you're probably right. Um, but there's equal pieces in there, right? Around we need to, um, well, anyway, we can unpack them if you'd like. Who works predominantly in for-profit businesses? Your clients are predominantly for-profit businesses. Okay, what about non-profit businesses as your, or non-profit entities, I should say? Couple, and government, who's got government as their primary client base? I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, but no, you'll find the same, it's a similar sort of matrix in here, right? If you can find what, what the equivalent is from a business impact standpoint, the thing that the organization wants to move the needle on, and you can actually quantify it, which is the million dollar point to John's point, um, you can find yourself in that top box and you will always win in that box over any of the three other boxes. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. How do you relate to the cost of whatever you're gonna charge for uh, over the entire contract? You're gonna be bringing uh, value and like you say, it's gonna be an exceptional delivery, so it's ironic. Yep. How would you associate what you're gonna charge that quantity with the work you have to give investment for and what you're charging each client? I, in my experience, you absolutely can. Like if they have rock solid conviction and numbers to back it up, right? Edward Denning's quote, uh, in God we trust, all others bring data. Um, that if we can bring data that you can quantifiably say, this $30,000 spend equaled $3 million in profit. And then you say, and by the way, it's gonna be 300 grand next time. And you go, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm being a little facetious. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Now we're just, yeah. <laughs> Everything you're going to make minus a dollar uh, probably doesn't work either. Uh, yeah. Of the, of the literally hundreds of people I know who are in the training industry, yep. not a single one charges on a contingency basis. Right. Why do you think that is? That, 
that was my question. Do you, do you guys know what he means by that on a contingency yeah. basis? Does everyone know? Yeah, for those who are comfortable saying I don't know, um, basically saying that I will charge you based on the outcome, right? um, as opposed to here's my fixed fee on the project. So any guesses as to why that rarely happens in L&D? Yeah. They don't know how to measure it. Yeah, right? Because it's really easy to blow holes in it. Right, to say, here, I made you this extra money. They go, yeah, but all these other things led to it. Right? So it becomes really difficult. So I actually did it with one. Yeah? Um, and uh, the client was very active. It was all three guys that I was working with. Way more than that. Otherwise, we just sort of disappeared to the bottom. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Interesting. You need a good lawyer. Is any, any lawyers in the room? Help this man out. Did you have a question? Yeah, we help, we help with the implementation. And just actually just building off that. So there, there's literally no no pitch here, right? Everyone knows that. Like I'm not, I'm not selling actionable. If you want to talk about actionable afterwards, I'm more than happy to. And I will weave stories about actionable through. But everyone knows that, especially for the first timers here. There is no like, surprise, take your credit card thing at the end. <laughs> um, just so we're totally clear on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a big part of what we do for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the number one reason is that we, we don't know how to quantify it. And to your point, in many cases, if we're dealing with the vendor procurement person and we've been asked to deliver coaching for a person X or a training on topic Y, right? Sales is, is the most likely to be able to see that connection. Right? If you're doing a sales training or training of any kind for salespeople, you can see a direct correlation. But if you're training the accountants in a multinational firm and they never see the light of day, right? Just back in some corner mm -hmm. office somewhere. Um, it's really difficult. And, and in many cases, you don't know what you're supposed to be doing from a business impact standpoint. And that's why you so often see training programs around how we're gonna develop better leaders, right? They're gonna be more empathetic. They're gonna be um, more um, direct. They're gonna be better coaches. And we might get to a place of, you know, it'll improve retention. It'll improve productivity. 25,000 ways to measure productivity. That, that might be as far as we get in most cases, right? I have a slide in a bit that sort of showcases the differences in there. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, I'm sure you're Hi. probably going to be uh, talking about this later, but you know, for something that is abstract, for example, social media content, uh, social media marketing consultation, or even like vocal coaching, um, I'm sure you're probably going to talk about this. But how do you package and how do you communicate that identifiable? Yeah. So we're going to talk um, right now um, about leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Are there any data scientists in the room? A little bit. Do you want to come come up and help? I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I do not want to. It's the interactive portion of today's session. Um, I am not a data scientist. I'm fortunate to work with data scientists, but I am not a data scientist. So I will give you my uh, sort of layperson uh, description of, of how some of these pieces work. But to address your your question, your point. Okay. So let's talk about data. First of all, I want to give you a bit of a cautionary tale that has nothing to do with the number ten um, about uh, data and measurement. Uh, about five years ago, we took on a substantial cash injection into the actionable business, um, about five million bucks. And we were, got kind of drunk on the money, on the money, not literally drunk, but drunk on the money. And we started spending money on things and building a team and we were building a big marketing team. We had seven people on staff with marketing and one of the wonderful human beings on our team was tasked with building our social media presence. That was about as much direction as we gave her, right? Um, we need to build our social media presence, why? Because we do. And uh, one of the metrics that she designed was around a uh, number of likes on our Facebook group. So we religiously tracked the number of likes on the Facebook group. And there was able to say, you know, when I do this activity, it leads to X number of likes on the Facebook group. The challenge with this, is that uh, that actually had zero impact on our business whatsoever. Number of Facebook, there, there was no correlation between number of Facebook likes and uh, moving the needle on the business, right? So when we think about marketing, what we often do is there's, there's an inciting event, there's a thing that we do. So she was spending money on Google ads, right? Or Facebook ads, I guess, in that case. And then there's an outcome. And the outcome that we wanted was more clients. And that's what we were aspiring to. 
the lagging indicators would be how many clients that we actually gained, how many new people we had in our client base. That becomes the ROI and validation, right? Being able to say, when we do some marketing stuff, yada, 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 six months later, three months later, whatever the lag time is, we've got X number of new clients. We could say a client is worth X, and so therefore the ROI is Y, right? So it sort of validates the, the process. That assumes though, that we have leading indicators in there, conversion stages if you're in a sales and marketing world, right? So one of the assumptions was that Facebook likes was a conversion stage to get people to the client stage. But we had absolutely nothing to back that up. That was just a assumption that we made. And so what happens then is you end up with this third type of metric, which is, which is a vanity metric, right? The number of Facebook likes or Twitter followers or, or LinkedIn, whatever, whatever might be a leading indicator if you know that it's part of your funnel, but it also might just be a thing that you're tracking because you thought it was a good idea to track it. And that's what it was in our case, right? We were stuck in this vanity metric space. Is that, so we just took, took a detour into sales and marketing land, yeah. Any questions on leading, lagging, or vanity metrics? I wanna make sure the terms are clear and then we'll apply it into selling intangible. If you don't know they're vanity, Right, exactly. Well, yeah, potentially. I mean, you also, but there was nothing to suggest that that was fact, right? Like we hadn't done any sort of experimentation to say, oh, it looks like we can convert, you know, 0.1% of our Facebook likes. It was just this assumption that we made, right? So some of you that teach marketing are just shaking your head right now. I would call, you should have called me. Um, I'm sorry, it was years ago. We were drunk on money. Um, so when we think about our own training with uh, the folks that, that we work with, training, coaching, consulting work, right? they have their own lagging indicators, which in many cases will become the, um, the actual money earned, right? Costs saved or asset appreciated. That's the ultimate sort of business metric that we would care about. Is that fair? And there's assumption around what the leading indicators are. But in many cases, there's a large gap. If we go back, these people, there's a large gap between the people here that might have clarity around what the leading indicators are leading to the desired outcome and the people that are actually doing the purchasing, right? If you ask them, why are we doing this? What's the business impact you're hoping to achieve? They'll give you one of those, right? And then maybe include their boss in the conversation. So it is a challenge for the entire industry. Who's familiar with that? It's usually a pyramid. Do I know what this is? So this is something called the Kirkpatrick Phillips model. Has anyone heard that before? There's, it's largely, well, it's contested from time to time. Uh, Dan Pontefract, who's a local, uh, is like a violent advocate against this model, um, but it's still largely used in the learning and development space. And what it talks about is the five layers of value uh, in, in uh, assessing the value of a L&D program, so coaching, training, consulting. And it starts with this, right? Do people enjoy the session? We call these happy sheets or smile sheets. Right. It's at the end. Who does training? Cool. So when you leave the room after training session and the client does the obligatory rate the speaker out of a, you know, one to 10, right? How were the sandwiches? How was the speaker? How was the temperature of the room? This is literally what they'll put on the sheet. Like you're just one of the, um, yeah. um, they measure that because then they can probably go to their boss and say, see, I hired the right person. Everybody loved this person. That's, that's ultimately what they're doing. With that. The learning retention side of measurement is around coming back in and surveying 30 days later, 60 days later to say, hey, we taught you some stuff, do you remember it? Yeah, I remember it, great. 85% of L&D programs are measured at one of those two levels. Question, stretching? Learning. learning and development. So this is the HR function typically or in larger companies it's learning and development. What most business leaders care about has nothing to do with those things. Yeah, it's nice, it's good. If our people enjoyed it, that's helpful. But ultimately, if it doesn't get to a place where it's actually generating different results, right, I don't really care. Again, I'm going totally hard-nosed, cash-conscious CFO, COO person. If I spend money on something, it should generate a return. That's a, that's a sort of fiscally responsible business leader's mindset. We could call these lagging indicators in the learning and development space. Are these leading indicators or vanity metrics? Well, it really depends. It depends on, to Roger's point, if they actually translate into 
results. The missing link in many cases is around measuring the impact. When we talk about results, we just talk about KPIs. So if we go back to the sales team example, right? I want to, um, I'm going to bring in a sales trainer to work with this team because I want them to make, A, I want them to generate more sales. And the way we're going to measure that is number of sales calls generated, right? Or close ratio or some other KPI, key performance indicator that they've identified as being an important part of the process. Okay, cool. So they're up here, they're measuring that. Did people remembering stuff actually lead to that? Well, we don't really know until we can look at the individual behavior changes that take place. So if we look at this back on the original sort of graph timeline, this is pretty clear. Ideally, we'd like to get to a place where there's one screen that says, I spent 10 grand here and it generated 50 grand. Yeah, that would be great. But if we try to back it out, we can look at the business impact, the actual KPIs that they're measuring the, to their own internal systems. Yes. If we can look at the activity change, so if the close ratio going up is the business impact that we want to have, the activity change might be more outbound calls, right? So they're probably measuring that type of stuff internally. But there's stuff that happens before that. And one is around the behavior change leading to that activity change. One of the gaps that we see is organizations going from, or training groups going from, I feel inspired, I want to do better, I want to apply some of the stuff that I've learned. There's that desired change, that intended change. And then the organization measuring the activity output of that. But as Roger was suggesting, if we sit in a half day session or a day long session or a multi day session, and then we go back to our desks, we've got emails to catch up on and phone calls and our team members weren't there and we're the only one there. And so we're trying to do something new and it's very difficult to change the status quo when we're the only one from that group that's actually trying to change that. And when we're focused entirely on the activity. Because the challenge is that the activity only happens when we're motivated to actually make change happen. Right? Is anyone here a runner? Because then you run <laughs> places. Good. Um, have you always been a runner? Yeah. You have? Yeah. Okay. Has anyone gone from not being a runner to being a runner? Yeah, Dave. Why? And well, I moved out of Vancouver. I had a group of very social thing. Mm -hmm. So we decided not to point out the ground for a while. So we came to a club like this. Mm -hmm. And then the last couple of years I've been doing it. The behavior change comes through the motivation that we feel from social expectations, from or desire to be a part of that, from a life change, something that actually saying, oh, I just, you know, I have high cholesterol or whatever, and that shocked me to my core. There's a behavior change driven by motivation that leads to the activity change of actually doing the hard work of running. Right? The first time you actually go running, if you haven't been a runner, it's not a pleasant experience. Right? It's like most physical things or really anything. We're very comfortable being good at what we're good at and being okay with not being good at everything else. Yeah? And then we try to do something that we're not good at. The temptation is to just stop doing it because it's outside of our circle of comfort, right? So the motivation is the thing that keeps us coming back to the activity change. The activity change is not by itself a driver. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify what's the difference between behavior change and behavior change. Sure. So behavior change is the, um, the motivation to shift. It's the mental shift around I'm going to do this thing right now. Right? The activity change, as it's mostly measured inside, flipping it back to client organizations, is the output of that new behavior. Right? So measuring the number of calls. Right. If we're going back to that sales example. So the activity is I called 10 more people today than I did yesterday. That's the activity. Right. But the motivation to do it comes through a behavior change. The behavior change is largely something very small and habit centric. What's coming to mind for you? I would. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> What's often happening here, right? And when you're being brought in, they'll have some degree of clarity on some of these things, usually not all of them, right? So the intended change may or may not be something that's clear to the person that's actually contracting you. Hopefully it is. And if it's not, you can probably get it from the person one layer up, right? What do you wanna have happen as a result of this training session? Right? And if they say, oh, nothing really, we just want you to come in and entertain them. Well, now you know. Right, and that, that happens. Um, 
but it's one of the first things that goes away when budgets get shrunk. But usually there's some expectation on intended change. And in many cases, that's where it ends, right? And that's going back to the Kirkpatrick Phillips model. The, this is the, the learning retention being the highest level of measurement in most cases is because the intended change is that we have more effective salespeople. And the way we're gonna measure that is that they remember new sales skills. Like the, that's not a direct match, but that's usually as close as they get. Yeah. When you uh, measure sales before, sales after, and say, oh, it's all me, I did it. <laughs> you could try. Um, yeah, I mean, and this is the activity change. I mean, the business impact is typically a lagging indicator. So sales activity, come right back to you. So the sales activity, depending on how long their sales cycle is, you're gonna have to wait a long time before you can show that. And then the challenge is the longer you have to wait, the more they can poke holes in it to be like, yeah, but the economy changed or this, this competitor went out of business or right. If they want to, they can poke holes in it, right? But yeah, that's the idea is to be able to say, Here's the business impact before and after I was involved. When it's done in isolation of, here's the numbers before I came in, I came in, six months later, here's the results after, it can be difficult to show the causation, right? There could be a correlation, and that's where you get great testimonials and people talking about how wonderful you were and how this absolutely led to great change, but it's anecdotal usually, and, it's, um, and it's, it could be, be shot down, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you've got a, when you've got a really well organized, John and I were talking about this before, uh, James, sorry, um, a really well organized organization, um, which is already limiting the pool dramatically. Um, they have had clarity from the outset as to here's the strategic direction that we're going in. Here's the competency gaps. Here's the skills that we need to develop. Here's the trainers that we're bringing in. It's going to align with that strategic plan that, you know, I like to believe that that usually happens amongst 1% of the company in large organizations up at the top. And then as soon as it starts to get communicated through it, it, it gets muddy, right? And gets lost. But that's what we want to get back to, absolutely. In an ideal world, we have that. And if you're working with companies of less than 100 people and you're working directly with the CEO or the founder, then yeah, you can probably do that, right? Or at least you can work from a position of, all right, so you said you want me to come in and coach Steve. Great. Let me understand where you're going as an organization What's the overarching change that you're trying to create for this entity? And how does training Steve or coaching Steve fit into that? Right? And start to, to plot this. My point with this, I guess, uh, are we sending the slides out after Roger? No. no? Will be on the video. Okay. So if you want to take a picture of this, but basically ask yourself when you're in a client pitch, how many of these things can you answer? Because my strong suggestion to you is the more that you can answer, the more likely you are to be, if you go back to the two by two matrix, the more likely you are to be positioned on the right hand side of that. Right. The right hand side of that, yes, it's been a long day. Being able to show the business impact when you can show the links between all these different pieces. Yeah. You have a slide uh, like this with examples from the specific business. Okay. That's a great idea. Do something other than sales. Yeah. So we're working with a customer service group right now. Um, so they're a um, petrochemical lubricant company. Um, super exciting industries we get to play in. Um, and they have a, actually, no, I'm going to do a different one. So this is actually, this, who works with companies less than 100 people? Who works with companies with like 100 and 1,000 people? And bigger than 1,000 people? A little bit? Okay, cool. So good. So I'll use the smaller company example. So there's a company called DTL, uh, Diversified Transportation Logistics uh, out of Toronto. They're a 99 year old company and they do freight logistic auditing. So basically company wants to ship something, company's going to do the shipping for them. These guys sit in the middle and they act as sort of a broker and that's about it. If there was ever a company ripe for disruption, it would be this, right? This is the industry that's just ready for technology to take over. And they see the writing on the wall. And so about a year ago, they said, we need to shift. That was, first of all, they did a customer survey um, to see how they were perceived in the market. The market said, dependable, reliable, nice people, super boring. We call you when we need you. Right? So, you know, that, that sounds a lot like a computer. Um, and so 
they saw the, 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 the need to shift their client perspective. And so they're actually going through a whole culture change around um, how do we go from being passive order takers to being proactive freight consultants in that regard, right? They have a hundred years worth of data, right? They literally used to contract with people that rode horses, right? To ship stuff. It's amazing. And so they have all this data. And so how can we leverage that to turn ourselves into more proactive freight consultants? So they designed all the process stuff around how to do that. They built all the systems, but now they've got a group of people who have largely been working here for 10 plus years who are used to being people pleasers on the receiving end of phone calls. And now we need to shift that entire culture to be more proactive, reaching out to people and overcoming some of the stereotypes we may feel about being pushy or being you know, salespeople. How do we shift that actual culture? Right? And so what they identified was the ROI was effectively staying in business. That's what they were trying to achieve. The business impact was going to be that their clients would happily take their phone calls and refer more business to them. So increase a wallet share. That was their desired business impact. The activity change was going to be the customer service and analytics people proactively reaching out to clients and those having positive effects. So that's the activity change was more outbound calls and net promoter scores going up in, in parallel. So that becomes the activity change. The behavior change in that regard was deep. Right? Like there's stuff around getting past mental barriers of being, uh, being pushy, right? Or uh, how am I actually providing value? Or do I dare question or suggest an alternative path when the client calls? So the behavior change components in that piece were, were really quite internal uh, and, and um, what we might call adaptive change as opposed to technical change. Anyone's familiar with that body of work? So there was, uh, I'm sort of throwing out a couple, but those are, those are some of the pieces of the behavior change. And the intended change from the beginning of the learning event was our people will be more proactive and outgoing freight consultants. Does that help to clarify? Cool. So behavior change is often quite deep, right? Like the activity change is more clinical. It can fit in a cell on a spreadsheet. The behavior change is there's human beings involved and we need to actually shift how we think about how we show up in the work that we do, right? So it's got some substance to it. What was fascinating about that event was that, or that engagement was that six months after they started this, working with actual in that case, they, uh, they'd increased their bottom line by 13%, bottom line, right? They'd increased their top line by about 12% without increasing headcount at all, which was pretty cool. So we had clear ROI on that case, but what was beautiful about it was that we were able to map the activity change and the behavior change and the individual intended change in sync with that. So the people that in the organization that were responsible for that increase were the ones that had actually gone through the active behavior change. Why does that matter? Behavior change, that's the focus. Why does that matter? For you guys, that matters because it shortens the cycle between you doing work and them understanding the value of what you created. If you actually can map, if you have data underlining this whole thing to say, here's what you're trying to do, and we'll know that six to 12 months from now based on the business cycles that they have, right? If you don't have a way to measure, if you're not focused on measuring these pieces that sit in here, then you have to wait six to 12 months before you can actually show quantifiably the impact that your work had. And then to our point from earlier, it's, there's a lot happens in that time frame, So you know, it runs the risk of being shot down as being you responsible for that, right? Although I do like that. Who did that earlier? That's right. Yeah, you did that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what? Where was I? What? Thank you. Why does this matter? It allows you to actually speed up the cycle. Now that we've done that work with DTL and being able to show them that the behavior changes that we were mapping three days after this, the learning session, actually six months later led to that change in ROI, the second time we go back to them or we go to the next client to say, here, when you start to see these behavior changes, it means it's gonna increase X, right? Or it's going to improve this. They can start to make decisions faster, right? They work with you longer, yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we we always as a business we invite them into the conversation. So what that looks like 
is, hey, here's the thing that we're doing as an organization. A little sound bite, right? We can give that to a group of people. You four are on a team together. Here's the thing. We're going in this direction, right? You go, okay. Some of you read the thing, watched the thing, whatever, right? If I just told you for, here's what you need to do now differently, people are naturally resistant to that, right? It's like, you know, you hear this all the time, right? People don't like change. That's entirely untrue, right? We choose to get married. We choose to move to new cities. We choose to buy new cars. We choose to go to school. We choose to change jobs. We love change when we are choosing to do it, right? When it's thrust upon us, we hate it. Of course we do, right? Nobody wants to be indentured, right? So, so part of it is instead of saying, here's the thing you need to do now, right? Which makes people just shut down. We invite them into the conversation. Here's the thing that's happening for the business. What do you guys think? Do you care? Now, it doesn't work if I'm the CEO and I'm in the room asking that because what response do you get? Uh, uh-huh, yeah, sounds good. Mm-hmm. But inside people are, their souls are dying a little bit. Right? So instead, if you give people, and there's a whole body of work called appreciative inquiry. Has anyone heard of this? A couple people, great. So appreciative inquiry basically invites this sort of conversation, right? So it's the what, so what, now what? So here's the what, we're going in this direction. If I give you the opportunity to have a conversation about this, so what, how does that impact us? Or in my language, do we give a shit? Do we as a team actually care about this at all? What's fascinating is that it takes it, well, this isn't fascinating, it's human nature. It's terrifying to do that as a leader, particularly in a small organization where you need, well, in any size organization, but you work with these people every day to say, I'm gonna let you guys decide if you actually care about this direction. Right? Because what if they say now? Right? Now what? You've just invited them to have an alternative opinion to you, and now you're, you, know, you might have active resistors. 93% of the time, we work with about 40,000 people a year. 93% of the time, when you give people an opportunity to actually have the conversation, they will find personal relevance. I've always believed this, but now I'm delighted that I have data to back this up. Because aside from the 2% of the population that are sociopaths, People, when they take a new job, want to contribute to that organization, right? 98% of the population does not show up for work going, how can I screw the company? (laughs) At least not initially. But when you get beaten down and told what to do and told you have to do it this way, and if you live in a state of fear, then you know what? Maybe I will screw them a little bit by taking some extra creamers home. Whatever. That gets a laugh. That's good. Thank you. Let's, let's warm up here, guys. We got you. Um, <clears throat> people come to work wanting to contribute. There's a, the, we want to be part of a community, right? The reason that we go running in some cases is because we want to feel connected to that tribe. We spend more time with our colleagues than we do with our chosen family members. Right? We would like that to be a positive experience. Many of us, particularly in the corporate world, have become just so beaten down that we don't believe that's even possible necessarily, which is sad but it is possible. And one of the best ways to do it, one of the fastest ways to get back on track with it is to give people an opportunity to have a conversation about the thing that the company is trying to do or the organization is trying to do and why should we care? So they can find personal relevance in that direction, in that change. And again, 93% of the time, they will. Then you lead into the now what, which is okay. So we just talked about it. We understand the strategy better because we had a conversation about it. And it's literally a conversation, not through technology, but eyeball to eyeball, let's sit around the lunchroom cafeteria or the boardroom table and have a chat. We, used, we worked with a large pet food uh, distributor chain and they would sit on 50 pound bags of dog food and have the conversation about this direction of the company, the guys in the warehouse, right? And they would chat about, is it relevant to us? What would we have to do with the fact that we're expanding into Argentina? I made that up, they didn't expand into Argentina, but How does that connect, you know, large scale strategic plan to me as an individual contributor? And I think it's, there's a danger for all of us as consultants and for senior leadership in particular to make the assumption that it's not relevant to everyone in the organization. So we won't bother including them in the conversation. But inevitably, if I work here and I'm part of this organization, I want to feel heard. I want to feel as though I am a part of it and not just a cog in the machine. And the best way to do that is to invite input. That was a very long answer to your question. Does that help? Yeah. That was my, I'm gonna get off the soapbox now. Good, back. What else? What other challenges are there for you? Yeah. So with this idea, with bringing this to life with your clients, 
Does anyone have a real world scenario you want to throw going, I do this work, I can't see the connection between what I do and what you're talking about. We can do it. Well, yes, Jen? Well, two people interact. We have in our mind a vision. And the other human has a mind, has a vision in their mind. And it's like two circles. How much of those circles actually overlap? And what I do, and what I discover is that one side, the client, has this circle of reality. And then the other side, their customer, has a circle of reality. And they, they're they thinking of a different future. And one circle is working towards their vision, and the other circle is working towards their vision. But now, these two circles have to overlap. right? So you have to come in there, and you've got to somehow move those two circles so that they overlap enough so that money can flow through you. You're in the middle, you make a piece of that money. So it, it's actual, the vision that each person has is their reality. And when you go into a, a situation of business, your vision and your reality may not match your clients or your customers, but you have to understand what it is in order to move the two circles together. So right away, there's a gap. Just the moment that you start, and you've got to close that gap. And then that, that's when all of this knowledge and wisdom and, and skills and talents come in to bring those two circles together. So if I, if I could build off that, so where I've been going with this has been largely around uh, training or coaching. Yeah, you've been brought in to impart some wisdom to unlock the intended change right, because the business wants to make some sort of business impact. Consulting, if I'm hearing you on that front, around actually looking at the, the whole structure of the system. Who, who would define themselves predominantly as a consultant in that regard? Okay, great. So change programs, that sort of thing. We've got multiple people involved. It can be the learning event may not be around teaching a new skill, right? But rather around them consuming a new piece of uh, information around the strategy, right? Because how do most companies communicate strategy? They do, they spend some time building a 300 page PowerPoint deck that no one's going to read. Then they do a town hall with the CEO talking for a bit. And some people watch it, some people don't. It's at a 100,000 foot level out of necessity. Most people really struggle to find the relevance in there for them personally. Right? So if we can take that 100,000 foot version, most of the strategies that we see have four core tenants or five core pillars or some sort of sort of chunking within it, right? You take each one of those pillars and help them help help understand what the client is trying to do with that. Like what's the business outcome of actually applying this strategy and then provide each of those slices as a sort of genesis for conversation for each team to have a discussion around that particular element of that strategy. You can go through this entire same process. Right? You can bring this to life. We're doing this with L'Oreal, uh, the cosmetics company in, um, in APAC. So we're about nine countries in Asia. And it's around their strategic, their next 12 years. They work in 12 year cycles. Um, it's a French company. I can't pretend to explain it. Um, but they, uh, they're launching this 12 year strategy. So you imagine it's coming from Paris. You're in South Korea. You're on the receiving end of this 12 year strategy for a multinational organization, 500 sub entities within it. And it's got four pillars. Like how are you possibly expected to take that Right? and distill it down into something that's gonna shift your work. Particularly because none of us are sitting around waiting to shift how we operate to be in line with the company's objectives. Right? Everyone is very busy. Everywhere you go, everyone's busy. And so how do you do that? You give people the opportunity to actually have that conversation to find their own relevance within it. To have a shared understanding across the organization, have hyper-specific relevance for each small team everywhere on the planet so that they can shift behaviors that are going to impact the activities that have been identified by leadership to say, these are the things we need to do now. So 12 years from now, our strategy is realized. Okay. It's not a small undertaking. I'm not suggesting this is a really fast process to go through, but doing the work allows you to better align the measurement between the thing that the business is trying to do in the first place and the thing that you were hired to do um, as an extension of that. Yes? Uh, so you were asking me about challenges yeah. Okay, so I work with artists, so musical artists specifically, and I work on coaching them. 
both musically but also in terms of building their brand and yep. doing things like that. So um, my question to you would be how would you package that sort of coaching you know, to an artist? Because you know, very much in the business, there's very clear, very yep. clear ROI by looking at the artist. And it's easy to maybe fall on bandwidth Sure. So a couple of things. So in the case of music, having followers might be not a vanity metric, but exactly what you want, right? Because maybe those turn into subscribers or, um, or purchasers of your music, right? The other thing, when you're selling direct to the individual business owner in that case, there's an emotional appeal, right? Like I spend money on stuff that doesn't make sense on the balance sheet, right? Me personally, because I like it and I want it. Right. Which is, which is different than what I'm trying to get to, which is you still need that in any sales position, right? Where the person that's actually buying from you, there's an emotional draw to what you're offering. And the space that we're in has lots of emotion tied to it. People want to be better leaders. They want to be better spouses. They want to be better musicians. They want to show up more fully, right? In whatever capacity. So the emotional side has to be there. What I'm trying to encourage is that the business logic and showing the path to that business logic needs to be there in a corporate environment and in a business environment, it'll give the justification um, to the person that's more financially focused, right? So in your case, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the, I mean, the behavior change may be around practicing some of the things that you're teaching. If you're a vocal coach, getting them to trill every morning or whatever the case may be. I recently had a vocal coach, which is how I know that expression. Um, if you ever want to get totally freaked out, look on YouTube for x-rays of the tongue movement when people are singing. It's, it's crazy what's happening in here. This is a random aside, so. <laughs> fun fact for today. Um, so the behavior change will be some of the, the practices, right? The habits that you want them to be establishing. The actual activity change might be around more performances or booking better gigs. I, I, I don't know without knowing the space, but you can actually focus here right, without spending a tremendous amount of time here in that case, because you are making an emotional sell, right? You can also leverage that where if you can showcase the behavior change that's taking place for your clients to say, my clients trill more often, or, um, you know, have learned, you know, their, their fifth uh, chord progression on their guitar, I, I don't know, but whatever. Um, and you can show that quantifiably, then you can get people going, yeah, that's what I want. I want to improve that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it largely depends on the scope of project and who your buyer is. So if your buyer is the same person that you're delivering the training to, be it a musician or a coaching client where the company's not paying for it, I'm paying for it directly. There's thriving practices, I'm sure many in this room that come strictly through referrals because they're like, Kevin's great, right? And so you don't need to focus on any of this necessarily in, in that case, right? If you have layers of decision-making or if you've been hired to deliver a half-day session and they have a fixed budget for that half day session and you want to go from two grand for that afternoon thing and you see opportunity to solve a larger business problem, you can scale that up dramatically by focusing on this end of the spectrum. Okay? So there's a guy we work with named Todd Atridge who's based uh, in Port Hope outside of Toronto. And so Todd is a coach, he's a trainer. He largely does uh, Brene Brown stuff. He's certified in all Brene Brown stuff. And so he'd get hired to do half day trainings. He charges well, I think it's like five grand for the half day session. So he's, you know, he's in a certain uh, caliber there. Coaches, he just signed a $380,000 program that he's delivering across an organization because he was able to focus the conversation up here rather than on, oh, you need Brene Brown stuff? You need stuff about transparency and vulnerability? Great, I can do that, right? By taking the time to say, I can do that, but before we get into rates and logistics, why? Why is vulnerability? The important to you and your organization and marching this across with the client to be able to get to a place uh, and, and again this took months right but getting to a place of the ceo understanding that todd could deliver that but that todd wanted to do it in the context to actually moving the needle 
suddenly he's at a different level, right? He's playing with different people in the organization. Does that help? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, just, to, I, just to sort of, one of the key problems that a lot of coaches have is what you call ghosting. So huh. where their clients, they hire them, but at some point in their coaching process, right. the, co the, the clients kind of disappear. Right. And so what you often hear is, well, I've had a coach, but you know they didn't do this or they didn't do Y. And it's, it's often the client who disappears, not the coach. So can you just talk about this as to how that would help a coach to limit the amount of ghosting because it does have that integration from a behavior change perspective? I think it's out of value there that it is also good for you as a service provider, not only as somebody who has you know with the client actually ongoing in their organization. Right. Uh, so I ghosted my physical trainer <laughs> fully, like just disappeared. Right. I'm sure he thinks I'm out at sea somewhere. But um, but why did I do that? Right? I signed up with good intention. I wanted to get in better shape, better than this, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe. Um, <clears throat> that was thanks, guys. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, so I had the good intention, but but I didn't really have any motivation beyond the fact that I just didn't like the way I looked in the mirror, and so I wanted. To, but there was no like deeper connection to it, and there wasn't really any clarity around what I was working towards as an end result, and I wasn't tracking anything along the way, and so. I wanted to quit, but I wasn't courageous enough to actually have that conversation because I didn't actually want to quit, but emotionally I wanted to quit. And so it's easier just to disappear. Can anyone relate to this at all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Just, just me for going home. Um, so, so part of where this plays a role in any sort of change process where there's going to be a low point, right? Everyone read uh, The Dip by Seth Godin? Great book, talks about, read it. You will love it. Good, uh, it's like 95 pages too. You can read it on the, on the SkyTrain home. Um, the Dip, he talks about the fact that we, we lead with great intention and then we go through this period of challenge, sort of the, the trough of despair before we pop out the other side where we see all the results of our output. Um, most people quit most things when it's on a big enough scale but you can increase the likelihood of sticking with it when you have um, personal accountability around behavior change. So I'm, I'm now leaning into the actionable application, but any way that you as a coach or trainer can keep in touch with the person who committed to making a behavior change while intention was high, and then actually see that progress, you can catch it earlier. So before they ghost you, you can see them start to slip off so you can catch it and get them back on track with it. Right. Is that what you had in mind? Yep. Great, no problem. So let's, let's talk about habit change a little bit. Good. Actually, can I get everyone to stand up? Just because I'm getting warm and it's late, so we're going to meet somebody. Connect, say hi, turn around, I'll give you 30 seconds, then we'll come back. For...
All right, and whenever you're ready, come on back. What? To answer this question, because I like this one, I'm an artist. Yep. <laughs> so, and the behavior changed as you want the productivity of artists. Yep. I think you need ADD. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more about getting more focus. Focus in creating a better routine. Yeah, nice. So, awesome. yeah, I didn't nice. want to cut in your. No, that's good. In your By all means, feel pretty cut in. Good job. Yeah, um, I thought I'd just raise up a bit right. just to make sure your mic um, is picked up just in case. It's right now the handheld. It works. Yeah, it works. It works. Um, that was good. Is this actually the break or is this that yeah. ish? That was the test. Yeah, I just. <laughs> All right, come on back. Come on back. Whatever you like. Good, a little more wick. Lauren? Lauren, what's been most useful for you so far? That idea of reconnecting to the driving why behind the organization and my connection to it. Right? If I had a connection when I was first hired, right? it reminds me of the story. My, my grandfather used to tell the story about uh, a friend of his who uh, was celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary with his wife. And the wife was quite excited and joyful and looked sort of like we made it 50 years. Um, and the husband was quite distraught. And the wife said, what's the matter? And he said, well, you, you just, you never tell me that you love me anymore. And she sort of looked at him with this shock look on her face. She's like, John, I told you when we got married that I loved you. And if anything changed, I would have let you know. <laughs> <laughs> he delivered it much better than I did. Um, but it's this idea that when we sign on with a company or, or, you know, companies do such a great job now, many of them around painting a very clear vision as to what we stand for as an entity. They can do better, but by and large, it's way better than it was 20 years ago, right? And so people get inspired and they join an organization because they are connected to that why. And then in many cases, it's never talked about again. And so I've been here six months, I've been here a year, I've been here two years, that stuff fades, right? We, not, the, not the connection, but the, the, the consciousness of the connection, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, it's a ton of work too, right? To clarify that vision in such a way that it, it connects with everyone inside the organization. What's been interesting uh, using that approach of giving people a chance to have a conversation is that people will often find, well, they do 93% of the time, find their own why 
right? That may or may not be directly aligned to the stated why on the wall, right? But it's, if they find their own why, which is infinitely more powerful than when we're thrusting our why upon people. Right? Yeah, Dave. So for me, the, the, the last model is the one that you gave. Uh, polls that a group on something like uh, 12 years ago, I was the director of operations. That sounds <laughs> awesome, by the way. <laughs> Right. Um, and so we were trying to get the line to agree to a standardized way of doing things. Hey. Right. Um, and because I was the director of operations and I stood down there and I, I asked the questions, things happened. So I got the left side but never got the right. And I could never understand why it didn't survive. Right. And this is, this is pretty common, right? Like we see this, particularly when you think about most organizations, if they're promoting from within or if they're bringing people in from, well, whatever. People that end up at the leadership positions inside an organization have been typically fairly process driven, have been really good at building process, meeting expectations from a forecast standpoint and building a repeatable process into that, right? Because that's, that's where organizations make their money is in that repeatable process. And so, the expectation then can be, because we've been doing that for 25 years by the time we're in that senior role, is that when I communicate where we're going down, I will focus on the process side of it, right? Which, is, which makes total sense when that's where the money is in the business. Being able to connect the people to that process through finding that internal why is, is where the, the magic happens. Well, to be a little clearer, I think I got the behavior change in the activity, yes. but I never got Oh, I see. Interesting. So they never bought into why they were doing it. They didn't really understand. It. Hey, I, I want to do things my way. My way is better. Right. Yeah. And, and they never understood the greater whole uh, of, the, of the change. Got it. Thank you. Let's talk about habits and change at an individual level. This was so we, I started the business twelve years ago. This wasn't really a thing. All of these books have come out in the last twelve years. Right, around habits and the sort of sexiness of habits. Um, I mean, on the cover of Time Magazine in 2018, right? The Power of Habits, which is also the name of Charles Duhigg's book, which I think sort of put this on the map. But uh, Atomic Habits just came out a couple months ago. It's a New York Times bestseller. The Coaching Habit, New York Times bestseller. Tiny Habits, already a New York Times bestseller. It's not even out yet, right? There's a uh, nudge, some really fascinating work they're doing in the UK. This has become sort of a, um, a collective interest uh, societally speaking around habits. So it's a great time to be tapping into some of the behavior change pieces because most people kind of want, it's kind of an interesting science for people to learn and it's not that complicated, which is good too. So if we think about the intention flowing into behavior change, that's where I want to focus with making new learning stick. How do we actually do that? So let's assume that we've all attended some sort of learning events where we've heard some new information. You can use any example you want. Could be any event you've been, no. Um, this one, think about this, this event that we're just at. And the fact that you're gonna leave here with probably, if you've been taking any notes, you probably have tasks on your list, things that you wanna change when you get back, and maybe you have habits, things that you actually wanna improve over time. At any learning event, so think about your clients attending your session, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching conversation or a large scale event, they're going to have notes that include things to check off their list and things that they may wanna level up on as human beings, things that they want to improve over time. Okay? There's nothing wrong with either of these sides, but it's acknowledging that they are different. And so what I'll often do if I've been running a session on whatever, um, is ask people to go through their notes and put a T or an H next to the to-dos that they have on their list. Is it a task? Is it something that you're going to check off and done? Like talk to Richard about topic X, right? Or is it a habit, something that you want to level up? I want to include more behavior science in my proposals or whatever the case may be. Task or habit, something ongoing or something one-off. The problem is that we often confuse them or blend them, and then we go back to work and tasks are easier to do, habits take a little more thought, and so we end up doing the tasks if we do anything and we sort of ignore the habits. And the, the bump of value creation from the learning event is short. Right? We made a couple changes and then we went on with our, with our lives, so to speak. If we can take one thing and actually level up from each learning event that we participate in, we can effectively sort of reinvent ourselves over time. So how do we actually create new habits? 
Has anyone set a New Year's resolution in the past? New Year's resolutions? Who's done that? Okay. Just like a third of you? Good for you. The rest of you have broken out of the system. Um, so there's a, a, sorry? I broke out of the system yesterday. Perfect, yeah, there you go. Um, the University of Scranton, um, which is not just from office, the office, uh, it's actually a thing, um, did a study that found that uh, January 21st is the saddest day of the year. Potentially for two reasons. One, uh, because most people have broken their habits by then. Uh, and secondly, it's because when you get your visa bill uh, from the Christmas holidays. But, um, but most habits are broken by January 21st. And so why is that? What is it about the habits or the commitments that we set that actually end up breaking, that we break them that, that short a period of time into the year? Any guesses or thoughts? Sorry? They're not reasonable. Can you elaborate? Like they're just too big? Yeah, there's a few different pieces in there, right? One is they're super lofty. I'm going to run a four-minute mile. Okay, right, maybe. And sometimes they're, I'm going to get in the best shape of my life. I'm going to exercise six times a day. I'm going to uh, eat only green things. I'm going to be a better spouse. I'm like, all the stuff, right? Yep, so that can happen. Yep. Life, sure, we fail to take reality into account, right? It's not like it's just not a priority. Sure, totally. It was important to me at the time, but maybe it's faded in importance. Yep. Usually there's no measurable steps to make I like where you're going with this. There's no, there's no intermediate steps where they are rewarding themselves along the way. So they've gone from, I haven't been off the couch in six months to I'm going to run a marathon. Right. And anything short of running a marathon is a failure. Right? And so, yeah, of course, right. We're like day four and I'm using this running thing a lot today, but we're day four into running every day and my knees are sore and I'm never gonna be able to run a marathon. So they haven't, they haven't made it small. They've sent the big lofty ambition. Yeah. You can't see the results. For sure, right? There's no immediate gratification on it. So that happens, yeah. They have a resolution, but they don't have a plan in place. Right, because they set it at 3 a.m. on New Year's Eve, right after a few cocktails. And you go, I gotta get the best shit of my life. Um, <laughs> I did that sort of joke at a previous session and someone came up afterwards and said, you do that way too well. Uh, <laughs> it's a gift, what can I say? Uh, yeah, there's no plan in place, right? And, and in many cases, the commitment that they make is, is quite vague, right? Like, like I'm, I'm gonna get in shape. Like, well, what shape? I'm already a shape. I'm in the shape of a potato, roughly. I, like, what does that mean, get in shape, right? And so then we can sort of lose focus and life takes over. Yeah, totally. Anything else? Any other ideas? Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't tell anybody, right? And so if this falls down, then maybe it's not such a big deal because I'm the only one that knows, right? It actually is a big deal. There's a huge amount of study around that and breaking commitments to yourself, but we will skip that for another day. A guy named Michael Bungay Stanier. Has anyone heard of him? In the back. What's your name, sir? David. David. Nice to meet you. You've heard of him. Cool. So Michael uh, wrote this book called The Coaching Habit. If you are a coach or you work with leaders, it is worth picking up. Self-published book. It's now sold almost three million, or sorry, three quarters of a million copies, which if there's any self-produced uh, uh, authors in the crowd, you know that that's a massive number. Um, but he talks about uh, the new habit formula. And a lot of his work, like most of the books that you saw on the previous screen, uh, come out of uh, Stanford, a guy named BJ Fogg, who's been studying behavioral psychology and individual habit change for upwards of 30 years. And all of that work is, I, I like the way Michael's positioned it. It's simple, it's accessible. It talks about creating a new habit consisting of three parts, a trigger, a current habit, and a new habit. We translated it into English. It looks like this. When X happens, instead of Y, I will Z. Fairly straightforward. But I do want to unpack each of these uh, in a little bit of detail. So the first is a trigger. A trigger, what, what we're really trying to do with the trigger, the only thing we're trying to do, is we're trying to interrupt the automatic patterns that we have in our lives. Right? There's, I was talking to a behavioral psychologist. And I don't know if this is actually true or not, but I'll share it anyway because he has some credibility. And he said, uh, if you were to consciously think about every act that you go through in your life, you would literally fry your brain. You would literally die if you were consciously aware of every decision you made throughout your life. As a survival mechanism, we put most of it on autopilot. Right? We don't think about most of the things we do. And if you want proof of that, it's that commute that you do regularly. And when you leave one place and just sort of arrive at the next place, it just happens. 
and you sort of you just tuned it out and you just sort of went about your your day your activity right the trigger is designed to interrupt that the automatic state and so in order to do that we need to tell our brain with as much specificity as possible when we want to wake up and so the trigger becomes location based time based activity based right i want to get in shape is not a great commitment because it doesn't have any trigger tied to it whatsoever right as well, flaw number one but so trigger might be when my feet hit the floor in the morning, right? it's very specific. It's activity-based. My feet hit the floor in my bedroom, probably. And so it's, it's got a very specific location, probably a similar time to it. We can tell our brain, wake up. We need you to be consciously aware of the next step. So setting a trigger, we want to include as many of those as possible. Any questions on trigger? Yeah, exactly. It's very similar. I mean, again, it's all based on the same guy's research, but, uh, but Charles Duhigg popularized it. And so cue or trigger, you could use an interchangeable word for it. Yeah. You're talking about the early in the conversation. That's right. When you're talking about what it means to uh, yep. trigger, um, what there's this habit or that subconscious level that we can have. Right. So if you want to stop doing something, you're still starting doing something else. And so the format works for, for both. When we're trying to break a bad habit or create a, a good habit, right? If you want to look at it that way, it's still around what's the trigger. So smoking being a classic example, right? So what's the trigger? It's not, I want to quit smoking. There's nothing tied to that. So the trigger is when I take the lighter out of my pocket or something that's specific, right? When I tap the pack or whatever it is that the smoker does, that's very specific to go, right, that's the thing. It's not when I light my cigarette, that's too late, right? It's something that's... The more we can tap the trigger into a ritualized, ritualized activity, right, the more likely it is to wake us up. So when I brew my coffee in the morning, right, or when I press my alarm clock in the morning, or whatever it is that I do all the time. And in the case of smoking, it can be that when I take my lighter out of my pocket. That's one that I've seen used regularly for this. And the current habit is the thing that you've trained yourself to do automatically. So I'm going to move away from the stopping a bad habit for a second. But it doesn't it's not necessarily a bad habit. Right? So in my other example about when my feet touch the floor in the morning, instead of doing the zombie shuffle to the bathroom, right, which might be the thing that I normally naturally do, there's nothing wrong with that, right? but, but it's the thing that naturally happens. The more we can identify and say to ourselves, okay, I'm consciously aware of the fact that when this happens, I then do this next, right? then we can say, so instead of that thing that I naturally do, I will do this new thing. And the new thing, is far more likely to be effective to stick if we make it laughably small. Laughably small, very, very tiny. Okay, that, okay, great. Is that, okay. Is that different than, anyway, cool. Um, all right, so laughably small, super tiny, something 30 seconds or less. The idea with laughably small is that it's easier just to do it than it is to justify not doing it. That's the thing. So in my example, when my feet touch the floor in the morning, instead of zombie shuffling to the bathroom, I will do one push up if I wanted to get in shape. Why are you laughing? Laughably it's laughably small. <laughs> so it's laughably small, right? Because it's really, at that point, it's like, really, can I really justify not doing? I guess basically have to fall down and then sit back, stand back up again, and I'm done, right? Like it's, it's not, so, so then I just like do it. And then, of course, once you're down there, it's just easier to do a couple more. But the commitment is not when my feet touch the floor, instead of zombie shuffling to the bathroom, I will do 15 minutes worth of intense exercise, right? Because then when I'm zombie shuffling going, I should that, and then I'm going to keep going to the bathroom, right? Because it's like overwhelming, the thought of doing that. But one push-up, laughably small, easy to do. So if we, so we put this in context of um, training workshop around customer relationship skills, right? So people leave well-intentioned from sessions like this, from the client sessions. I want to be better at topic X. We want to go really specific. So when I speak with a client, ideally it's when I say hello, right, on the phone. Thank you, good, all okay, right. that's all right. So, okay, I got a five minute warning and I have like half an hour left. <laughs> I got lots to cover. Um, so when I speak with a client, instead of immediately jumping into solving a, an issue, I will ask one more probing question something that I probably learned in that session, right? Something very specific, something very small. 
It's not about trying to boil the ocean. It's about the small change that I'm going to do right now. Yeah. Yeah, so in this, like with the when I speak with a client piece, yeah, so we could probably make that more specific, right? It's when I'm sitting at my desk talking to a client, or we could make it something, I, I left it sort of generic here. It's still, it's still better even in this format than this, right? Because there's always that someday maybe thing. Like we leave being like, I'm going to be better at that, right? One of the speakers yesterday um, was around uh, basically relationship presence, being present with your spouse. And I think it... I left that talk with that sort of feel good, like, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that. I'm going to be better with my wife. But that, that doesn't translate into an actual activity, right? It's, it's, a, it's a good intention, but then I'm going to get home. I'm going to be jet lagged. I'm going to be tired. I'm going to be cranky. And so it's, you know, then it'll just sort of slip. And then a couple of weeks later, I'll be like, oh, that thing that I should do something with. It. And then it'll just sort of fizzle away, right? And so instead, just being able to say something a little more specific, a little more tangible, right? Even if it's not the perfect structure. This is as much, there's a science to the structure, but there's no like absolute right format for this, right? It's, it's just something more concrete than what we have usually when we leave from the intention standpoint. Does that help? Okay. Questions? Who's, yeah. This is, this is habit stacking is the, the scientific term for it. The, yeah, and this is one of the fundamental challenges, right? Even if you get your client from the place of, we know what the intended outcome is of your session because we know what the business impact is that we want to achieve. We know how we're gonna measure it. We want that to happen now, right? And it's around cultural shift. It's around big sweeping change that they wanna have happen as a result of this session, right? And that's not how human beings change right we don't we don't just plug in like keanu reeves and i know kung fu that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't happen right we we need to build incrementally over time right the best running example that i've seen is when i do the zombie shuffle across the floor i will put on my left shoe right that's not the end game right having one shoe on is not the goal right but it's the first step because once my left shoe's on it's a lot easier to put on my right shoe than just take off my left shoe and once they're both on i may as well at least go outside and pretend i ran now I'm outside, I'm like, oh, I should probably just do something. You know, it sort of, it builds, right, incrementally. And this is one of the fascinating parts to watch is that when you run a training session and you have 16 groundbreaking ideas that you're dropping on your audience, right, they and you, at the time, want them to do all those things and be all those things, right? But you're a subject matter expert. You've developed these over years of experience, right? They are going to get overwhelmed. The canyon is too big to jump from current state to future state. It needs to be that first little step. And so the best thing you can do in that situation is to help them appreciate that there is no too small a first step. That's my tweetable moment for the day. There is no too small a first step, <coughs> truly. Anything that they are shifting, the smaller the better, because the chemical sort of um, cycle that kicks in is that when you do that small thing, the dopamine hit is, oh, that was good. All right, what else can I do? And it builds on to the next time. And then the next day you go, oh yeah, yesterday I felt really good when I did that thing and then you do it again. And it builds over time. This idea of streaks of habits being built over time is really important. I'm going to butcher this, but one of my colleagues used the example of how many organizations want to create a baby, and they've been told that it takes nine months to have a baby, and so their solution is to put nine women in a room together and hope that they can have a baby in one month. So that's, that's, that's not how it works, guys. Yeah, so it's all right. I did all right. I'll tell Alyssa. Um, but that's... That's how many organizations think. And so there is an educate, there's an education reframe, it's good to ask the question, um, around shifting people's thinking to, there is no too small a first step. It needs to build over time. It's not an overnight change. This is all part of the education with your client, right? And going back to the linear model, if you can show them that it's surprising how quickly it builds, considering how small it starts from. It's the idea of having a penny and doubling it every day, how much money you have, you know, six months later. It's a similar idea, similar approach. Yeah. What are your strategies for getting, getting the people that you're working with to implement after they leave that state of being motivated? Like when you're working on, when you're working with them one on one, or yeah. if you're an event, how do you make sure, or how do you best set them up for success? 
they, gently, they're not allowed to leave the room until they have a well-crafted commitment. Okay. Lock the doors, Roger. Lock the doors. Um, no, but seriously, right? Because it, it's that intention. And, and we often do this. Like if you do coaching or training, it's like, what's the one thing you're going to apply when you get home? Like, I'm going to be do this in customer service. There's a specific technique or tactic that you've taught them. Great. Codify it. Write it into this format, right? Identify the smallest first step, not the end state, the smallest first step, right? And actually have them write it down. Have them talk to one another about when are you going to implement this, right? How are you actually going to start putting this into practice? Are we going to hold each other accountable to this, right? How often should we be thinking about this? All those pieces. And this is what we've built into the actionable. Again, this is we've just leveraged the greatest science around behavior change and, and giving people a vehicle to do that. But that's the piece, right? Before they leave the room, because the second they leave the room, they're already forgetting stuff they learned from you. And they're also getting bombarded by other urgent to do's, which are important and they should be doing those things. So we want to, before they leave, capture their commitment to the small behavior change and have a system in place from support and accountability to move forward. Yeah. Sure. So uh, the question was, what habit have I, we're getting very personal here. Do you want to, did you bring wine? I'd like, <laughs> um, the question was, what habit have I developed that I thought would be most beneficial now? Is that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. That question. Um, yeah. So I had a habit of seeing everything through a binary lens. It was either this way or this way. And I didn't realize that that was something that I was wrestling with or that I was, that was part of my sort of coding, right? And I worked with a coach and I unlocked that. And so the commitment was when I feel drawn to make a decision, instead of treating it like I need to decide now, I will let it breathe. Let it breathe is actually a really bad new behavior, right? But I had spent 16 hours with this coach in this like intensive two day thing, identifying like that had a lot of meaning to me, right? And so that's, that's sort of what I mean. Like this, there's a structure to this that scientifically makes sense and human beings are complex. And so don't feel like it has to be exactly this. What we really want to get to is, can we identify when we slip into old patterns, what those old patterns manifest, how they, how they manifest, what they look like, and the thing I want to do instead. And so for me, the let it breathe is to give consideration to the fact that there's hardly ever only two choices. Right? There's, there's almost always an almost infinite number of choices. And so to have that, and it's, it's, it's literally saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, yeah, Roger. When is it going to take a laughably small first step? Yep. Am I not going to run out of activity as I'm doing it? Is that the bigger goal, the end game, really quickly? Maybe. Yeah, I would say you probably will if you don't have a connection to what you're trying to realize at the end anyway. So what I mean by that is one of the things that we don't show up on here, but that is a critical part of it is why? Like what's the reward for you in doing that? Right? One of the, it's fascinating. One of the questions we have built into our software after they've made a commitment is uh, why? Basically, what's the reward here for you? And when we built that question in, we sort of assumed that most people would have, I will buy myself dinner or I will get a promotion or something extrinsically motivated. What's been fascinating is the high, I don't have the exact stats, but it's well north of 50%. Call it 75% of people that don't put in extrinsic things, they put in intrinsic things. They put in, I will show up as a better colleague, or I will be more trusting, or I will have a greater sense of calm, or something much more internal through it. So to come back to your question, there needs to be that connection to the greater why. What, what output is this new habit going to create in your life? Or go beyond, I want to run a marathon, to I want to have a long life so I can escort Maybe, yeah. I mean, for again, making up my stats here, about 25% of people, I will run the marathon is great, right? That's the thing that motivates them on it. And it's enough that they get out of bed to do it every morning because it's the reconnection to the bigger picture, right? Putting on my left shoe is not the end game unto itself. It's that I will be able to ultimately run this marathon. But even running a marathon is not easy. It depends on the person, but it could, yeah, it could be either or, right? But, but to your point, and your point, I think, from earlier, if they don't have, if, if you don't have a why, right? Like, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put these up. So here's commitments that you can choose from today. We're gonna use this, you guys can make commitments in the app. 
if you've got, when speaking with current or future clients, instead of providing exactly what they ask for, I will ask one question to dig deeper to uncover the business impact. If you just choose that because it's the first one on the list and you, I don't know, yeah, good. Um, then you're gonna, you're not gonna follow through with it, right? There's no greater drive from you. But if it's around, you know, I'm actually interested in taking my business beyond the provide service in the room and leave, provide service in the room and leave. I want to build longer lasting relationships. I wanna have more impact. I wanna do bigger programs or one of those five things I just said, then you're far more likely to follow through on that, right? that connection to a deeper why. It's also the first step, right? That's a big piece with this. It's not about shifting everything. It's about achieving that first step. So I'm sort of quasi guiding you guys through this process that a client group would go through. So based on the three areas that we spoke about today, here's three different things that you could commit to. You guys can read, so I won't read them out too. But comment memo number one around client perception, commitment number two around deeper understanding on leading indicators, and number three around understanding behavior science. So actually practicing the format really is that third piece. So what I'm gonna do is give you uh, 10 seconds to sort of pick the one that most resonates with you. And then we're gonna get into little groups based on which one you chose to talk about the why. What is it about that that actually resonates with you? Does everyone got one? Anyone need more time? Any more time? Okay. You're on the couch too, so that's... Sorry, choose one of these. Choose, choose one of these, yeah as a starting point. You can tweak it. We got one? Okay, great. So if you chose commitment number one, put your hand up. Okay, so for you, if you guys wanna go over by the food stand when we say go, on the side there. Who, who chose commitment number two? Commitment number two, you guys can come up here, right around this table. And commitment number three, who chose commitment number three? Great, you guys can sort of hang out behind the chairs. And anyone not choose a commitment? Totally tuned me out half an hour ago. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna break. We spent five minutes sort of talking through why that matters to you, and then we'll come back together as a group. Cool? Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh, my ass. <laughs> yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> Sure. So, um, when I was hearing them talk about, because I asked questions about positions and potential coaching positions, both of their brand and also developing their skills, so I think that he found out was focusing more on the leadership indicators. So, showing off um, the behavior change, the activity change, and the intended change. So, that's why I picked that one. And why that's important to me, uh, I want to make sure that I'm having an impact. Like, I want them to understand that I have that there's going to be an impact. Yeah, so it's, I think it's more about leading the impact of the work that this is a little bit more leading lagging indicators and I'm actually So it's kind of interesting in the topic of diversity and talking about the individuals. Yeah, it's uh, I think um, yeah, about how we can work with each other more effectively, how we can work with clients, and yeah, on top of that, we can have more impact. Yeah, for me, my um, my advice would be work I do or do a. But you know, we don't get to the leading indicators in that class or the coaching indicators in that class. So for me, you know, I do the other things, 
um, in my work, but that kind of work. I do that as a function. I go to long RFI, which it is in So that is what I can start to think about the way that that is going to go into that ROI. like actually tracking and documenting the way that these indicators because they're kind of like more like they're like activity changes right there's like process improvements and system improvements and things like that but actually tracking the behaviors like how many times someone actually was like project grade or project month process or like actually tracking that and then being able to demonstrate that to the client oh yeah this is really variable take any action change this pattern um, or even working with the CEOs and founders of startups and they you know, often time they just like secret out how they're doing it. Um, we started to work with them to help parents with like changing their behavior and actually looking at what they're doing and like how many times they can like get a tag out or check the email and things like that. Um, I think it's really helpful to be actually proactive to um, set those up. Entrepreneurs and in things like business schools, I am always saying like you have to measure your impact. And so it's something that is beyond your KPI versus your financial results, etc. It's what is the impact that you're doing internally, externally, whatever. And so this really resonated for me because it fits with what I'm asking my clients to do, which is measure their impact. So I use a way to be able to help them to understand change that they're undergoing and the impact that that change is having for them. So it's just kind of tied with that message that I'm sharing with people, but also now putting it into action. Bring it back when you're ready. Okay, <clears throat> so someone uh, who wants to tell me something they heard from someone else in the group around why this commitment matters. So if you can tell me what commitment it was and what you heard as far as the why. Who wants to go? Marlon, you're up. It was something you heard from someone else in the group and which commitment you were. You made eye contact, man. That's that's it. <laughs> uh, what I hear, I heard a lot of great things. 
so ours was the number three, behavior science. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Because <laughs> it was expanding on what other people were saying, but the the reason being that responding to emails is kind of reactive. Yeah. Um, where putting in you know, your tasks is proactive. Um, and so that that was why. Um, if transitioning away from that, you might be. Okay, so the negative consequence being the driver there potentially as much as the positive? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Who else heard something? Who, who, who was inspired by someone else's message? Yes. Aaron. Aaron. Hi, Aaron. What did Aaron say? Well, it's basically people have a misconception about videos. Okay. A preconception or a misconception. Yes. So they say, oh, Aaron, you do videos. I need this and I need that. But in reality, they don't understand what they really need and what they really need. You guys were commitment one, yeah? yeah commitment one. Yeah. So Aaron made, made a very important comment that because I need videos. Right. And then he said, well, most people have a misconception or a preconception about videos. It's like, oh, my God. Beautiful. Now I have to learn something new because <laughs> I have to make a choice. Right. Well, in this, I mean, you're already elevating your status, right? From from like order taker to to proactive consultant on this, right? Like being able to help shape it and tie it back to their business outcomes. Do you think you want to add to that? Well, yeah. I mean, people with with the misconception or preconception might have an idea of what might be better than the books, but if you take a look at the deeper into the roots of of the problem they might have. They think is a problem might be more superficial yep. than to dig deeper and solve bigger problems in the business and have a greater impact on the Nice. I want to actually you can use that as an example too, because I um, we hired a video consultant, someone to help us because we had the similar sort of mindset of we need video. That was sort of end of thoughts, right? And then she didn't challenge that, the person I was working with. She just said, great, here's what you need to do. You need to shoot this many videos on this days of the week. It lasted about a week before we just stopped doing it because there was no driving why, right? There was no greater motivation behind it aside from, we thought we need a video, now we got busy, and so away we go, right? But if we'd be able to connect to that deeper place, then we could have actually stuck with it, potentially. I'm just sharing all sorts of uh, failure stories with you, personal failure stories. That's just why I'm here. Um, okay, so let's talk about, so you make a commitment, you found a personal reason for that commitment. There's a couple other pieces that we want to put in place in order to bring that commitment to life. This is for you and your clients. One is around choosing an accountability buddy. The statistics say there was an um, American training and development study done about 10 years ago, but by any account, it hasn't changed. You're 65% more likely to achieve your commitment if you just tell someone about what it is, the thing that you're committed to actually doing differently. So you've already sort of done that in your groups here today. The second is to organize regular reminders and check-ins on your progress, because similar to the example we were sharing about the marathoning, right? If it's just, I want to run a marathon, but nothing being measured in between, you lose momentum pretty quick. So having some sort of check-in on your progress, being able to communicate it, you're actually two times more likely if you do this via some sort of alternative method to where the noise is, meaning... On the actual system, you could choose a text message or an email. If you choose text message, you're twice as likely to follow through with your commitment because we all have way too many emails. We're starting to have way too many text messages, but um, for now, it's still a better approach. And the third is to engage in a structured reflection process 20 to 40 days later. You'll read all sorts of stats online about how many days it takes to create a new habit. Does anyone hear, what's the common one? 21 days. You know where that comes from? It comes from through. <laughs> Well done. So it's, it's actually based on a study about how long it takes for lab rats to totally remove cocaine from their system. Well, it's not at all relevant. That's the point. But it, it picked up as it was a, something to do with habits, drugs, I don't know. But it was the whole thing around, that's, that's where that number comes from. There is nothing proven around human behavior change being tied to 21 days or 66 days, or 45 days, or anything else you read, it's around repetition and around the, the size of the habit, right? Obviously, 
when we think about it. Right? There is no specific number of days. It's around the, the, the frequency, the number of times that we check in on it, and it depends on the size and scope of the habit. So you can Google that if you want, and you can share that stat next time someone tells you it takes 21 days to create a habit. Say, not unless you're a lab rat trying to kick cocaine. <laughs> Drop your mic. <laughs> But journaling is an effective way, obviously, to do this. Um, and this is really how Actionable works, the Habit Builder, which you guys will have a chance to experience. And the reason I share it with you is um, because you can use it for yourself, but it's also you can manually recreate it, right? In fact, most of the consultants that we work with had some sort of manual process for doing this. And so do that. My encouragement is that whatever, whoever you're imparting wisdom to or whenever you're having a coaching or consulting or training engagement, to think through what happens after and how you can best equip your your clients to, to achieve that behavior outcome. Because it's not only good for them, um, but it also reflects well on you when something's documented to show the behavior change that took place. So the way that we do this is you have the live events, people make a commitment on the habit builder, then they check in to some degree of frequency. They can have an accountability buddy who's gonna check in with them as well. And then a process at the end where you reflect properly on the whole experience. This was 30 days as sort of an arbitrary starting point. You can change it based on your, um, well, actually you can't, but when you're using it with your clients, you can change the, the frequency based on what makes sense for the group. Yeah, you're welcome. So you can also email me and I could send you this deck and anything else you want. So it's, it's chris at actionable.co. Or Chris's video will become, and this is on the video tape. It again with the slide. Yep. Cool. Uh, so, all right. So, this again, sort of leaning into the science behind what we do. I'm just going to skip over some of these pieces here. Um, but this is how actual is designed to anchor the behavior change. So, here's what you do you can do it right now. If you have your phone, you can go to start.actionable.co. It's going to bring up a page that looks like that. And then you're going to put in this session ID of JPVR. This is, <laughs> but only for the first 50 people. So buy now, but no, this is totally free. This is for you guys to, to sort of get in the headspace of what is it like to be a participant? Because what I, anyway, I'm going to give you a second to do that. And I'm going to talk through some of the things to watch for as you move forward. Anyone stuck? JPVR. And so when you go in there, it'll ask you a couple questions about the session, the relevance. Those are questions that I created specifically for tonight. And so consultants, coaches that we work with would customize those questions to capture certain things. What's that? Yeah. Um, then you're gonna make a commitment. So you can choose from the existing list, the ones that we, you guys identified one in your group, um, but you can also make up your own. You can also tweak it. So if there's something in there that you wanna change, you can change it. And then I think there's a couple questions after as well, also generated just for this session. Yeah, so this is an interesting stat too. We used to have it where you could do as many as you wanted. Um, if the likelihood of your following through with it plummets just by going from one to two. So we have, we have a low 80s, uh, low 80% of the room will follow through on their commitment based on the conversations that we're having today. Um, when we introduced a second one, it dropped to less than 35%. This is all stuff to share with your clients too, right? Because the, the push will be the resistance to this approach will be, yeah, but you had five major topics during your session. Let's have them make five commitments. Right? That's, that's not how we change as human beings. Five commitments is fabulous. Let's stack them. Let's do them over time, not all at once over the next month. Okay. Nine women in a room for a month do not make a baby. <laughs> I mean, said not with that attitude. <laughs> Yeah, you can. So you can do uh, 
so yes, and it, again, coming back to there is no right number of days. It's it's arbitrary based on the nature of the commitment. So uh, so you guys are making your commitment today. I set it up so that 30 days from now, it will prompt you to do a reflection exercise. But if it's a five day commitment, then five days from now, you can just end your commitment and do the reflection process. You don't need to carry it through for 30 days. And for the coaches and consultants that we work with, when you're setting it up, you can choose the appropriate length for their commitment. And usually it sits well, like if you're doing coaching engagements and you're talking to the coachee twice a month, you can have a 12 or 14 day commitment, right? That takes them through the session. And so if you imagine that they leave the coaching call, they've got a commitment to a behavior change, small thing, they use this. Uh, you'll see as you go through the process, did you get to the check-in wheel? Who got to the check-in wheel? To the process, a couple of people, cool. So you keep going, if whatever stage you're at. Um, so after you sign up, then uh, and again, totally free. There's, we're not gonna try to sell you anything, just it's for you guys for here, for now. Um, there's a check-in wheel. And so you're checking in every day on how you're progressing and you can journal about that. If you're the coach and you have a coachee, that's that lifeline, right? That's that connection to the person in between conversations. If you're doing large scale culture rollouts or whatever, it's for the manager to be able to see that for the people on their team and support them and have those ongoing one-on-one -on -one conversations. Anyway, it's not about actionable. It's about you guys. All right. So what do you think life would be like differently if you were to create that new habit? What changes for you? Okay, so I'm more productive, feel better on the weekends. I don't have that sense of there's other stuff I should be doing as often. So I don't know if any of those resonate, but something like that. It's a muscle too, right? So the first time you make a commitment, particularly if you draft it yourself or if you choose a reward, it's not going to be as good for you as the third time you do it. There's a sense of progress as you develop this approach. Yeah. Oh, there's 10 million habit apps out there, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, no, and there's, yeah, look, I mean, that's the thing. If you, if you want this, this habit piece, then go to the app store and buy something for $1.99, right? Like there's a ton of them out there. Some of them are more expensive than that. Um, we're not the right approach for that, right? We our, our approach is on the commercial, like on the business side around embedding it more fulsomely in a, in a client organization. Um, yeah, no, really good point. There's tons of habit apps out there, right? It's a booming craze right now. And that's kind of the point where like, I'm really, it, it, find something that works for you. Like my, my goal here today would be that in your client engagements, you're thinking about how they're shifting behavior and how that aligns with the organizational objectives. And in your own experience, when you're attending a learning event of any kind, that you're not just leaving with the notebook full of great inspiration that gets filed with all the other notebooks of great inspiration that you never look at again, right? Have that, but then choose the one thing so that you can make that small change, right? That's, that's really my goal here for you is to have an understanding of the science that will lead to that behavior change for you and for your client. In your client case, business impact for doing so. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Is there a particular app that you would recommend for the first consult? Uh, I think it's called Fabulous, maybe. I have it. I haven't opened it in a long time. This is personal. This is not our. This is not a professional recommendation. This is my own. I don't know. It's gone. So clearly, it resonated. Hang on. No, it's literally gone. I think it's called Fabulous, but it was like ninety bucks a year or something. Um, but it was still it was more. It was really well thought out. So good science. Run away from anything that tells you twenty-one days to make a habit. That's bad science. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Are you planning on using a web app? Like a native app? Yeah, for the corporate side, probably at some point. Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not going to enter into the, the personal uh, habit change space because there's all these great apps that already do that. Um, so our focus is really uh, twofold. It's on training sustainment. So what we didn't talk about, I kept talking about conversations, conversations, conversations. We have a methodology around those conversations, right? So as a business, we focus on how to structure those conversations that invite people to find personal relevance so that they're inspired to want to change in line with the organizational objectives and then they move into the habit builder and then our focus is really on the data visualization after that and natural language analysis and all that stuff if you have if you imagine like with l'oreal we've got twenty-two thousand people 
having monthly conversations around the strategy, right? Spanning nine countries and a whole bunch of different other tags that they've built in. We can, we can show that right back to the organization. Be like, here's how your people are responding to the strategy right? in real time, day over day. And so that that's where the business is for, for us. So in that case, that's L'Oreal. This is their employees, their employees having, yeah, 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 having the conversation. First of all, they did the CEO town hall, right? Everybody sort of pretended to watch it. And then it was, here's the key pillars of this strategy. And so now everyone in the organization is invited to participate in these conversations with the people they work with every day. So they have the conversation around pillar A, which I can't share, but pillar A of their strategy to be able to say, here's the thing. Does everyone understand? Yeah, kind of great. Do we care? Like how does this impact us in, I use a South Korea example, right? In South Korea, in retail at this location, what's the impact on us? Why should we care? What would we do differently? So we have a, we have a uh, methodology for that conversation. And then at the end of the conversation, they will make, they'll go through exactly this process of making a commitment to behavior change. And so it's around the organizational alignment in that case. In the case of training, how it typically works is you do a half day session, you've got four golden sections that are in there. Most people are gonna forget most of it, you know, within two weeks of leaving the session. And to Amir's point about the, you know, it wasn't Amir's point, it was the counter to Amir's point. You can't do it. You can't make a baby in a month with nine months. It can't be done no matter how hard you try. Um, and so getting them to commit to one habit change, having them revisit key concepts from that training in subsequent months through conversations. So they have a conversation about, remember that thing that Marlon taught us? Like, oh yeah, right, cool. All right, so let's, is that still relevant to us? Yes, it is, and here's how, great. Now what are we gonna do differently? And that's where we get back into that. So you get this loop of conversation, action, insight coming out of the data, next conversation, action, insight. So actionable within the integration, follow up with, or choose what you follow up with, or it's just the thing that you implement? It's, no, it's exactly, yeah, so we would, and again, anybody that wants to explore this further, I'm happy to, to dig into it, but the high level is that we would work with the consultant or the coach to build those conversations that the people that were in the training room would have without needing the coach present for the follow-up conversations. I mean, they certainly welcome to be there, but usually there's a cost issue, right, with coming back in the month. And so actual becomes a low-cost way for them to revisit some of those key concepts. The alternative in that case is uh, e-learning, right? We shoot a bunch of e-learning videos, we put them out. Great, right? What, what Patty does is a little bit different. Um, with Thinkific, it's course, it's within a structured format. In many e-learning platforms where it's internal, like a learning management system, right, you're getting about 9% adoption rate on that, right? Where it's just like, here's a bunch of stuff, go get it when you need it, right? Courses are different. When it's all the videos sitting internal, right, and you should go watch it at some point, most people don't, right? And, and there's good reason for that, but we'll get into that later. But um, when you invite people into a conversation around a concept, instead of just sending people to the internet, they're much more likely to consume that information, right? like literally nine times more likely from our uh, research uh, to consume it, talk about it, revisit it, apply it. It's a very long-winded answer, but yeah, no worries. <laughs> Patty's gonna knife me in the parking lot. Good, anything else? Great, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Hopefully it was useful. And uh, let me know if you have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime. <laughs>